um, pilgrims to be able to identify. Because I'm not going to require you to know the identifications of all 24 on the basis of how they're described. But there are several that you will need to know on the basis of how they're described. Okay? So we left off with... Who were we talking about? We were talking about the monk. Pardon? The friar? We got onto the friar? Just the That's right, because we were talking about how the friar makes it easy to do penance. Okay? Bottom of page 303, uh, about line 225, 226, where we're told, for unto a poor order for to give is sign that a man is well he shrew. That is, if you give funds to a poor monastic order, that's a good indication that you really are contrite and you've been properly absolved of your sins. Of course, you could flip that around and say, what, does it, what might it also show? You can buy forgiveness. I mean, you tell the priest when you go in there, hey, buddy, forgive me of these sins, and I'll, I'll write you a check for it. So, for if he gave, he dared make assert, or dared assert, that he knew that a man was repentant. That is, if someone gave, then the friar would assert, well, clear that person is really repentant of his or her deeds, right? So, therefore, 231, instead of weeping in prayers, instead of really being sorry for your sins, really being contrite, men may give silver to the poor friars. Well, which is easier? To really be contrite to really be sincere about, I was wrong, or to give somebody a few bucks. It's a lot easier to do the latter. So his tippet, that's his bag, is stuffed full of knives and pins to give to young wives, women. Wife there, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean married woman. It just means young woman, okay? Okay. What else? He had a good singing voice. He could sing. He could play on a lyre. Um, he knew all kinds of songs. Strong as a champion. We've been told he's a big guy. 240. He knew the taverns well in all the town. And every, every means each hosteler and tapster. Hosteler is the person who owns the hostel or in tapster barmaid who's, you know, pouring the beers. Better, he knows them, better than a leper or a female beggar. For unto such a worthy man as he, accorded not by his faculty, that is his belief, to have with such lepers acquaintance. Now, Chaucer does this for a reason. What was one of the things, for those of you who are Biblically literate. What was one of the things that the Pharisees often accused Jesus of? Being a leper? No, not being a leper. Working on the Sabbath with one. Hanging out with who? Uh, the wrong people. Yeah. Who are the wrong people? The, uh, Prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. And the uh, Samaritans, right? Samaritans. And what did he say? I didn't come to the healthy, I came to the sick, okay? Who does this guy hang out with? He doesn't hang out with prostitutes. He doesn't hang out with the sick, lepers. He doesn't hang out with the poor. He does hang out with the bartenders. Why? Because we're going to be told in a few lines, they give him food and such. We're told 245, he doesn't hang out, if you want, with lepers, it is not honeste. It is not acceptable. You don't want to be seen with the wrong crowd. It may not avance, advance. What's Chaucer mean? And he may not advance his career. Bingo. It won't do him any good. 
What good is it going to do to hang out with the homeless guy for your, for your livelihood? The homeless guy has what? Nothing. So why? He's a monk. Okay, a friar. Pretty much the same. A quote-unquote man of God. Huh. For to deal with no such poor ale, that is poor folk, but all, that is entirely, with rich and sellers of food. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the poor. He only wants to deal with those who are wealthy or who are sellers of food. And overall, there as profit should arise. Profit has the exact same meaning it did then as it does now. Courteous he was and lowly of service. That is, he would be courteous and lowly of service to those who were rich and sold goods. He would, use a modern language, suck up to them. There was not no man nowhere so virtuous that there's that triple negative again. The Nas is was not, or not was, no man nowhere so virtuous, he was the best beggar in his house. For though a widow had not a shoe, so pleasant was his in principio. And you've got a gloss there. In the beginning was the word, the opening line. This is his kind of homily that he uses to preach to people, to soften them up, to get them to give to him. So pleasant was his in principio that he would have a farthing before he went. Okay. But the old woman was so poor she didn't have what? A shoe. So this guy is able to, you know, wring the very last penny out of even the poorest people. His purchase, that is his income, was better than his expenses. And he could rage or cavort, as your gloss says, as well as a dog. In love days... There knew he or he could offer much help, for there was not um, like a monk with threadbare cope as is a poor scholar, but he was like a master or a pope. Chaucer saying, this guy's not walking around like a beggar you might see today, you know, on an entrance to I-24 or something. Somebody's standing there, clothes look a little ragged, look a little, nah, not this guy. He's dressed very, very well. Double worsted was his short cloak. What else? 264. He lisped for his wantonness, his affectation. Apparently lisping was a positive thing. To make his English sweet upon his tongue and in his harping when that he had sung, his eyes twinkled in his head aright, as do the stars in a frosty night. This worthy limiter was Clapid Hubert. So we've had Madame Eglantine, and Hubert, so far only two people are named. Chaucer's obviously named, the character he creates, and then the host, Harry Bailey, will be named. Okay? Then we get a merchant, and I'm not going to say anything about the merchant. You don't need to know about him. So, the knight you do, the squire you do, Madame Eglantine you do, the monk you do, the friar you do, the clerk. And the only reason I emphasize the clerk is because he is what all of you are. He's a student. A clerk there was of Oxenford also. That unto logic had long ago that he committed himself to logic. In lean was his horse as is a rake. His horse is thin. Dangerously thin, if you want. And he was not right fat, that is the clerk himself, I declare, but looked hollow and thereto soberly. Well, why is this clerk, this student of Oxford, so thin? Ordering books for next semester, and this troubles me every time I order books, I always try to, I, I usually try to order the best but least expensive book I can for a re required class. This is one of the Better ones, it's relatively inexpensive. Relatively is a relative term. For my history of the English language course, it's such a pain. Because the best books are well over $100. And 
And the book I ordered, the book I had the bookstore order, I'm not kidding, it's about that thick. And brand new, it's $154. It is not worth $154, okay? So when I ordered it, I told the person that I emailed, could you put on the note that students can get the electronic version? Because you can get the electronic version of that book for rent through Amazon, I think it's 19 or 20 bucks, okay? You can purchase it, I think it's only $30 for like a Kindle. And every one of you has a phone, and you can get Kindles on your phones. You can get Kindles for your laptops, your iPads, whatever. You don't have to have an actual Kindle reader. Okay? So I'm going to have probably everybody in that class is going to have their laptops out and stuff. Books are expensive. They're a lot more expensive in this day than they were today. Why? Because when Chaucer's writing this, how are books made? By hand. All by hand. Hand copied. Hand stitched. So, he had yet, he had given him yet no benefice. As I say, he's a student, but he's actually, he's finished. Clerk means, in Chaucer's pronunciation, by the way, would have been clerk. It's where the name clerk comes from, right? Kind of like an unemployed clergyman, a, a, an unemployed priest. He doesn't have a job yet. He doesn't have a parish yet. That's what's meant by benefice. Nor was so worldly for to have office. That is, nor was he likely to get one. For him was dearer he would rather have at his bed's head twenty books clad in black or red, that is, black or red leather, of Aristotle and his philosophy, than robes rich or um, fiddle or gay sultry. Now, the way most people read this passage is that this guy has got twenty books. 20 books would be, at Chaucer's day, like having everything that's in Walker Library. All the books there. This is why he's thin in threadbare clothes. He spends what money he gets on books. Most English majors are kind of usually like that. Um, he had but little golden coffer, etc., etc. Okay? He studiously studies, if study took you most care and most heed. Not one word spake he more than was need. That is, he's not free with his advice. And what he did say, five, uh, excuse me, 305, was said in form and reverence, in short and quick and full of high sentence. When he speaks, he speaks how? To the point and eloquently. He, he doesn't blab on along. He's not somebody who loves to hear his voice. And then we get a line or a passage, short passage, that is often included at the beginning of history of the English language books. In fact, the book I've ordered for next semester <laughs> used to have this as an epigraph. I don't know if it still does. I haven't gotten my uh, copy yet. Sowing in moral virtue was his speech. Okay, your gloss tells you tending towards. No, sowing. He sows. Moral virtue. He talks morally. He wants to increase virtue in his hearers. Why? That used to be the entire purpose of education. Was the teaching in virtue. Why? The ancient Greeks who came up with the idea of education. The academy. What was the purpose of education? to teach people how to live the good life. The good life didn't mean rich. It didn't mean wealthy. It meant virtuous life. Good in the sense of achieving excellence in everything one does. And gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Okay? So, know him. There's a sergeant of law who knows all the laws from the time of King William down to today. Today meaning roughly, let's say, 1385. Right? I'm not going to say anything else about him. You don't need to know his description. Uh, we can skip the Franklin. We can skip the group of um, kind of guild members. You have mentioned on page 306, you have a haberdasher. What's a haberdasher do? Make hats. We had a president 
who was a haberdasher before he went into politics? Harry Truman made hats, okay? You have a haberdasher, you have a carpenter, you have a weaver, that's the web, a dyer, and a tapester, excuse me, a tapestry maker, okay? So notice, all of these, except for the carpenter, are what? People who work somehow with textiles or fabrics, okay? So we're not going to say anything else about them. There's a cook. Here's what I want you to know about the cook. He's got an open wound on his shin. Yeah, you. And we're told, line 390, um, actually, where is it? Three eighty six. This guy can cook anything. Um, he could roast and seed and boil and fry. All those words, by the way, they're words that come into the language from French. They're various means of cooking things. He could make mortro that is stews and well baked a pie. But great harm was it as it thought to me that is it thought seemed to me that on his shin a more mall. A wound, an ulcer he had. Okay, now what's the difference between a wound and an ulcer? An ulcer does what that a wound doesn't necessarily do? It has a pus, right? Yeah, it's oozing stuff. All right? Uh, for blanc manger that made he with the best. And you got a gloss down there. Stew of milk, rice, almonds, and chicken or fish. Now, later it's implied, either that or my mind has just created this out of whole cloth, and I've, I've thought this for the last 25 years, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's in the cook's tale or something, that it's implied that while he cooks, some of the stuff from his leg gets in what he cooks. Yeah, it's really disgusting. Okay? And uh, how does that happen? So then, like, you'd be, like, cooking up to here, not, like, down here? Well, uh, it would depend. It would depend on how he's sitting. It would depend on what the, yeah, on what the level is, if he's cooking in a cauldron, if he's cooking on something flat that's sitting on fire, they can, bear in mind, they're traveling, so they're not necessarily staying every evening at a hostelry or something. Sometimes they're just out in the open. Um, we then have a shipman, okay, which we're going to skip, and I want to get to... You've got a doctor of physic. Where is she? There she is. I'm going to get to page 308, the wife of Bath. Line 445. A good wife was there. Make sure that's recording. Yeah. A good wife was there of beside Bath. That is, she didn't live in the town of Bath. She lived near it. But she was a little deaf, that's what some Dell means, and that was a shame. Of cloth making, she had such a skill, she passed those of Ypres and of Gaunt. Ypres and of Gaunt, those are areas in the Netherlands, Flemish to be particular, that were known okay, for their weaving abilities. She's better than them. What Chaucer's telling us is when it comes to um, making cloth, she's at the top of her game. She's the best there is. So obviously that can be something she does what? She takes pride in it. In the parish, wife was there none that to the offering before her should go. So in the parish, in the region of her church, no one should go to the offering before her. And you got a gloss there for line 8, offering. Gifts are brought to the altar during the offering, or what's called the offertory. Why? Let's say, just got to pick two. Let's say Jamie is the wife of Bath, and Kimberly is somebody else in the parish, and Jamie's getting ready to go up to the offering, to the offertory, 
And Kimberly skips in front of her. Which, yeah, that's exactly it. Why? Because if they did, certainly so wroth was she that she was out of all charity. Out of all charity means what? What does charity here mean? Love. Compassion. Love. It means love. It means kind of brotherly, sisterly, good, you want the best for the other person love. So out of all love kind of implies the opposite. Ripples. Yeah, hatred. You get in front of me, Kimberly, and I'm going to put a knife in your back. <laughs> and then I'll step on you on my way to the... So what's this tell us about her? <laughs> Sydney goes, my kind of woman, you know? <laughs> Quote, unquote, um, spiritual? Well, what she suffer from? Humility? Excess humility? A little bit of pride, maybe? Okay. She seems like a go-getter kind of girl. Go-getter kind of, you betcha, you know. Does she, like, want to go first to, like, make a scene of how much money she's giving? Is that why she's Could like be it? that, or to go first, why? Because she doesn't want to get lost in line. She wants everybody to see her. Okay. What else? Her cover chips, her kerchiefs. Full fine were of ground that is of texture. I dare sway they weighed 10 pounds. Her kerchiefs, her head covering. She wears so much cloth on her head. Chaucer says, had to be 10 pounds worth. Now again, why? It draws attention to her. Okay? So she likes to be the center of attention. What else? Her hose, fine scarlet red. What does the scarlet red immediately, symbolically suggest? Valentine's Day. What color roses, ladies, are you supposed to receive? There is a black rose that has been designed genetically. You gotta get, you wanna get a black rose? No, unless you're weird. Unless you're some kind of weird goth, okay? Don't mean to bang any goths, but no, red. You want a red rose. Why? What does the red symbolize? Love, romantic love, love passion, sex, okay? Red hoses. Hose, not hoses. <laughs> that is like fishes. Uh, <laughs> red hose. Full, straight, tied, shoes, moist and new. Moist means supple. That is fine, new leather shoes. Bold was her face. Why do you have bold and then bold off to the side? What does that bold mean? Courageous. How does a, how's a face courageous? I mean, yeah, that's what bold means. It means broad. Big woman. Okay? She's got a big face. Also, are that she has a gap between her yeah, we're going to get to that because that's the, that's the clincher. And fair and red of hue. Native American? No. So why is her face red? Why do people's faces get red? Usually only two reasons. Well, maybe three. Blushing. Blushing. Drinking. Drinking. You're out in the sun a lot. Your face can get red. Is it any of these three? Hmm. She was a worthy woman all her life. Husbands at church door, she had five. She's been married five times. How old is she to get married five times? We don't know how old she is. Without other company in youth, that is, not counting the men she had when she was younger. So she's been around. Now that could mean boyfriends. Or it could mean the men she had in youth. So what does this tell us about her? Well, you got to understand something about the medieval Catholic Church and marriage. And it applies somewhat today, though the, the church has gotten a little bit more lax. Marriage occurred for one reason. So you can uh, reproduce? Bingo. Propagation of the race. Keep, keep us going. Okay. St. 
Paul says, I would that all men were like me, a bachelor. But I know that's not easy. So if you're going to burn, that is, if you're going to live a lustful life, get married. Why? It's an outlet for your lust. So you can have sex. Okay? St. Augustine, 4th century, 4th century? 6th century. I can't remember. Early church. St. Augustine argued that there was... <coughs> What Augustine called original sin was passed on sexually. It's passed on through sex. The word that gets often used to describe it is concupiscence. I can't remember how to spell it. I think it's S C E N S E. Okay? Well, what's concupiscence? It kind of means like with sexual desire. Okay? So, Augustine essentially argued that part of what happened in the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had something to do with sex. Okay? So that when... Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the Bible says they realized what? They were naked. In other words, up until that point, Adam looked at Eve and he just looked at Eve like he looked at anything else. But after he ate the garden, he looked at Eve and going, whoa, you know, she's pretty hot. I'm naked. Yeah, and then he thinks, oh, crap, I'm naked. She's naked too. And so they make, you know, leaves and they hide from God. They have the whole interview with God, and God kicks them out, okay? Augustine called all of that original sin. So original sin is somehow tied up with sex, okay? So it became kind of commonplace in the Catholic Church. Well, you got to have sex in order to do what? Propagate the species? Yeah, or we die out. But, and here's the big but. Even though you're married and you have to have sex to keep, you know, to have children, pass on the family inheritance, all that kind of stuff, don't enjoy it. It shouldn't be pleasing. It shouldn't be pleasureful. So do it, but don't have fun doing it. Kind of like, okay, if we need another kid, okay, all right. But it's not going to be fun, Mike. So because of that, it was okay to marry. If your husband dies, if your wife dies, Okay, you can get married again. Okay, if that one dies, okay. All right, I understand lust. You can get married again, but you're really not supposed to go beyond number three. She's married five times. What does this tell us about her? She likes sex. This is a horny woman, okay? In other words, her hormones, they're just a flowing like crazy. But there's also probably a biblical allusion here. To whom? You mentioned, Connor, a class of people that Jesus hung out with, so to speak. The Samaritan woman at the well. She's a Samaritan. She's not a Jew. Samaritans are like, think of the Harry Potter stories. What does Draco Malfoy call Hermione Granger? That's what the Samaritans were. Why? Because they had been Jews, but they mixed their blood with other non-Jews. So to a Jew, they were the lowest of the low. Okay? Jesus goes. They're passing through Samaria. He stops at a well. There's a woman. He asks for a drink of water. She goes, what the hell? Why are you a Jew asking me a Samaritan? To give you a drink of water. And he says, honey, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me to give you a drink of water. And she's like, what are you talking about? And then her eyes are open. Why? Because Jesus says, you've been married five times and the one you're now with isn't your husband. She's like, is it really that obvious? No. 
she calls him the Messiah at that point. Okay. That woman, by the way, the early church does give a name to. She's not named in the Gospels. It's Photini, light. Why? Because the light comes to her darkened soul. She becomes, she and all her family become Christians, etc. They have, you know, children and all that house, according to the early church. So, she had five husbands without other company and youth, but there of needeth not to speak as no. That is, but I don't need to talk about that anymore. Why? Probably because the speaker Chaucer, the persona that Chaucer, the author creates, realizes, I'm getting on thin ice here. So I'm going to leave that alone. So what are we then told about her? She's been to Jerusalem three times. Why? Great place to go in the spring. Hot vacation area. What's she doing on this trip? It's the Canterbury Tales. They are von Langen folk to go on, on pilgrimages. She went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times. Middle Ages, it was thought, being a pilgrim is good for your soul, it's good for your body, you get out, walk a little, get in shape, but it's good for your soul. You go to a holy site, you get receive a blessing of sorts, okay? Jews are supposed to, good Jews, are supposed to, you know, go to Jerusalem at least once in their life, which is why they'll end the same with next year in Jerusalem. Next year we'll celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem, etc. Good Muslims are supposed to go to Mecca. Good Christians are supposed to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where Jesus lived and died and such. She's gone three times. What's this tell us about her? She's a pretty sinful woman. Is it because she's really sinful? And, you know, she, she goes to Jerusalem, she gets absolved and cleanses her, and she comes back home and finds another husband, and she's got to go back again? <laughs> could be. What else could it be? Could be just the opposite. Looks. It looks really good. Okay. That she is super spiritual. What else? She passed many a strange stream that is foreign water. She's been to Rome. So she's been to Jerusalem three, uh, three times. She's been to Rome. She's been to Bologna. In Galice, St. James, and Colonia. That is, she's walked the... Santiago de Compostela, the last kind of walking or trail or whatever it is called of St. James, the brother of Christ, who died in um, Spain. She's been to Colum These are all pilgrimage sites. She's done a lot of pilgrimages. She's really holy, really spiritual. She knew much of wandering by the way. And you've got a gloss. She knew much about wandering. What is it? Idiotic, asinine gloss. How does that help you understand more? She could have much of wandering by the way. She knew much of wandering by the way. What is Chaucer really saying? She's been around, right? Yeah, that's what he means. Because what does Christ say the road to heaven is? Straight and narrow. She took the long wandering way. Wandering by the way, by the way means off the path. Could be hearkening back to the other others in her youth. How do I why do I read it that way? Because of the very next line. Get to was she, was she, softly for to say, truly. She's got a gap between her two big front teeth, upper front teeth. And in the Middle Ages, a gap between those teeth indicated you had a licentious nature, promiscuous. You were sexually loose. Chaucer puts that immediately after, yeah, and she wandered by the way. It's kind of like she's on her way to <coughs> on her way to Cologne, and oh look, ooh, he's handsome. A little side diversion over here. She flies away. Oh look, he's pretty cute. That's the implication. 
Oh. Uh, my high school teacher told me that uh, the gap between the two was seen as kind of uh, sexy back then. Well, yeah, that too, because it indicates, you know, I've got a sign on my door that says, come on in. Uh, yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, I mean. It's, now I have well, to be a hooker. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, but that's exactly what it was. So, you know, you go to orthodontist and you get that gap tooth, you know, close. This is so ingrained in me. I can't help now. You know, I'm watching TV. I see politicians, et cetera. And, and I always, you know, I'll see one and there'll be a big, and I'm thinking, Chaucer, Chaucer would have so much fun with this person. Okay. So. She rides on an ambler, a saddle horse. It's got this, you know, giant wimple on her head that is kind of a habit. A hat as broad as a buckler or targe. That's a shield. A buckler or targe, these shields are like three feet in diameter. This is like a big old Mexican sombrero she's wearing on her head. <laughs> right? Why? It draws attention to her. Everything she does is designed to say, me, me, me. Spotlight, you know, she walks around with a flashlight so everybody sees where she is. What else? She wears a mantle about her large hips and on her feet a pair of spurs. In fellowship, well, could she laugh and cart, that is joke. See, now why not give a gloss there for fellowship? Because fellowship doesn't just mean, you know, having a good time with everybody. It, Depending upon the context, can mean having a good time. You know, going to a bathroom stall for a good time. <laughs> See, you know, what's the old 80s song? Jenny, I got your number, 8561309 or whatever it is. So, 8675309. Of remedies of love she knew perchance, perchance as it happened or by chance. Why? Because she knew of that art. The old dance. What's the old dance? Uh, Mitch, you've got a grin on your face. I think that means the uh, horizontal dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't actually mean that. It's sex, right? No. No. It leads to sex. No. Louder? Dating. Dating. Or... Seduction? Yeah, on both sides. It's a dance notice. It's not like modern dance, because modern dance makes absolutely no sense. People just writhing you like they're in pain or high. <laughs> this kind of dance implies what? There are proper movements. And one movement then requires a movement on the other side. It's all kind of choreographed. So she knew that dance, that is, she knows exactly what to say to get X, Y, Z, or A, B, C, D, E, F to do, just as they know. This kind of goes back to, think of the, the wife of Bertilek. What does Sir Gallant tell her? <laughs> you want me to teach you of love, honey? When I know you know about love, half as much as a hundred, uh, another half times as much as a hundred men, that is, you know about love more than 150 nights. Okay. Chaucer is saying she knows how to get what she wants. She knows exactly what to do. Okay. And immediately following her. So she's a religious person, right? She's got to be the first person at the offertory. She's been to Jerusalem three times and all these other places. And then Chaucer gives us the person. A good man was there of religion. Now, of religion simply means of Christianity. Why? There is no other religion in medieval England. In the, when was it? Mid-14th century, I think it was. Jews were kicked out of England. Kicked, kicked out of England. You couldn't be a Jew and in England. There were still some, obviously. So, a good man was there of religion. It was a poor, not person, person of a town. But rich he was of holy thought and work. So 
physically, materially poor, spiritually, mentally rich in holy thought. He was a learned man, a clerk, that is. He'd been to university. Like our poor clerk of Oxenford, okay? He was a learned man, a clerk, that Christ's gospel truly would preach. Truly. How did he preach the gospel? What does true there mean? Said it for what it was, right? Said it for what it was. Accurately. Honestly. He didn't, you know, embellish. He didn't take away. He said exactly what it says. What else? His parishions, parishioners, devoutly would he teach. Benign he was, wonder diligent, and in adversity, full patient. Benign. Not harmful. Okay? How can a person, a preacher, be not benign or harmful? Well, look at some of the other religious members we've had described. And not only religious members like the wife of Beth. She's a member of what's called the laity. Okay? I mean the other clergy members, those who have taken special vows and hold some kind of position of authority or initiation, like the nun's prioress, the monk, the friar. Okay? So here's our fourth member of that second estate, the estate of the clergy. And in adversity, he was patient. When life threw a punch at him, what does he do? Takes the punch, gets back up, dusts himself off, and goes on. He endures. And such he was proven many times. Why? Reluctant he was to do what? To curse for his tithes. Curse there means to excommunicate. If Brianna doesn't give me her tithe, I'm going to excommunicate you. Excommunicate means what? Isolate. Isolate? Send them into exile, right? It's not, it's not literal being sent into exi exile. I'm going to hell. Okay, it can mean going to hell. Excommunicate means you can't communicate. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you can't talk. It means you can't take the Eucharist at Mass. You can't be a part of the church. You can't confess. You can't get married, because that all happens in the church. And if you die, you can't receive last rites. And if you can't receive last rites, you don't die and automatically go to heaven. At the very worst, you go to hell. At the very best, you go to purgatory where you have to pay off your sins, okay? So he wouldn't curse people. He wouldn't threaten them with excommunication if they don't pay their tithes. Tithes are required by secular law in the Middle Ages. So if you don't pay your tithe, you can, you're a priest, let's say, you can send the archdeacon, whose job usually was to... Pay up. And if you don't pay up, the archdeacon then calls the sheriff. And the sheriff comes and takes you and puts you in jail until you pay your back tithes. Maybe see why Chaucer had a little bit of issues with some of the practices of the church. So, rather would he give, without doubt, unto his parishioners about of his offering and of his substance. So rather than force them to tithe, he would do what? He would give to his poor parishioners of his offering okay, and of his substance, what he earned on his own. His payment isn't solely determined by what the parishioners offer every week. Okay? He probably has his own little mini farm, so to speak, and he probably has a side job of sorts. And what Chaucer is saying is, this guy's so good that he would give to the poor in his parish of his own earnings. All right? 
He could, in little thing, have sufficiency. He doesn't need much to get by. So, describe him so far compared with the other members of the clergy. Has Chaucer said anything about this guy that undercuts him? No. And guess what? He doesn't at all. This is one of the characters in both the general prologue and in the tales that Chaucer doesn't say anything negative about. He is, for all intents and purposes, perfect. Not perfect as sinless, but this is a guy with real integrity. He really does what he says he's going to do. He really believes what he says he believes. He really puts it in practice. Wide was his parish and house is far asunder. So he doesn't have some little small parish where it's easy to know everybody, easy to take care of all the little problems. But he never left or neglected <laughs> because of rain or thunder, sickness or mischief to visit the farthest person in his parish. If it was a day like today, he wouldn't say, you know, I don't want to go see John because I'd be riding 20 miles and I'll get soaked and muddy and I'll wait till it's nicer weather. Or when he's sick, he doesn't stop from going and aiding his parishioners. So what do you think about himself? He doesn't really think much about himself. That is humility. He doesn't put his needs before others. He puts others' needs before his. That's kind of the definition of real humility. And he would do that how? I misspoke, because I said on a horse. How does he go? On his feet, with a staff. Because having a horse doesn't fit his character. He's not that wealthy. You have to have money to have a horse. Why? It takes a lot to feed a horse. And you have to take care of the horse. You've got to take care of all the trappings, the saddle, and bridle and everything. So... This noble example to his sheep he gave. Who are his sheep? His followers. His, his parishioners, his flock, as they're also called, because he is a pastor. What does the word pastor literally mean? Shepherd. 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 Okay. So, notice, not this noble teaching, this noble example he gave to his sheep. That first he wrought and afterward he taught. So if we were to write a book on examples of leadership, you know, for a marketing department or something, based on Chaucer, what kind of leadership does this guy demonstrate? There's a phrase today that implies. It's used all the time. When I was on a search committee for for our new chair last year, one of the people came in and said, I am a model of servant leadership. That's what he does. What does it mean? You lead how? By following an example. By being an example. Oh, by being. You lead by being an example. Because what it is, what does example mean? You do it as well. No, what is the word example? It's something to show you. That is, you have an example to do what? To follow. The example might be you're learning how to write as a kid in school. And so what does the teacher have usually up somewhere on a blackboard above the blackboard? It's got that long roll that shows the forms of the letters. And when I was in school, I don't know if you guys had this, you had the same thing for cursive writing. But cursive is no longer being taught in schools today. Okay. Why? So that, yeah, I know it's utterly crazy. So that you learn how to make those forms. That's the example. If you've had, you know, you might have had courses in English or introduction to literature, something like that, where you have a textbook and the textbook gives sample papers. What's the purpose? Learn from those examples. These are, you wouldn't put as a sample paper something that was horrible and earned an F. No, all those papers are papers that receive good grades. So he is an example. Before he even does what? Speaks. They can see what he does. Out of the gospel, 
He these or those words took. And this figure he added also there too. What figure? If gold rust, what shall iron do? See, the clergy are supposed to be gold. Why? They're the initiates. If you're a priest, you've had hands laid on you by a bishop, the Holy Spirit has descended the whole nine yards. You are supposed to be a good example. The laity, us, we're iron. We're not purified. We're not to that level. Okay? So if gold rusts, then how do you expect the iron to do any better? Because and the thing about gold is that it doesn't uh, rust as easy as iron does. Yeah, gold doesn't rust. So Chaucer uses that image intentionally. Gold shouldn't rust. If a priest be foul on whom we trust, trust there means believe. If a priest be foul, and whom we trust, and whom we believe. No wonder is a lewd man to rust. Lewd. Layman, yeah. Lewd also means unlearned. See, a priest should be learned. A priest should be able to read in Latin. Anybody know where hoc, uh, where, sorry, hocus, Hocus comes from? It's corrupt Latin. It comes from what are called the words of institution at the Mass or at the Eucharist. When the priest calls down the Holy Spirit upon the bread and water and says, Hoc est corpus. This is my body shed for you. This is my this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Hocus corpus becomes hocus pocus. Why? Because through time the priests, many of them, don't know what this means at all. And so what do they do? Hoc s and then metathesis Pocus. Hocus pocus. Alakazam. It's magic, right? So, shame, no wonder it is a lewd man to rust. And shame it is if a priest take heed, a shitten shepherd, that is, a shepherd covered in shit. <laughs> And what? And a clean sheep. Okay? Shame it is if a priest take heed to have or to be covered in shit when he's trying to tell his parishioners about what? Their sins. Or to train them about being clean. Well ought a priest, example for to give, be an example, by his cleanness how his sheep should live. He doesn't mean literally. Okay, He means by what? By example. So a priest, according to the parson, should be what? In the eyes of his parishioners. Loud? Clean. How clean? Like washes daily? And by the way, no. Medieval people did not only take a bath, you know, once a month or once a year. That's a that's a urban legend. We, we we know many of them washed frequently. Okay, maybe not as frequently as Americans, because we tend to be a little anal about this, but maybe more like Europeans, shower every couple of days, kind of thing. Right? What do you mean by clean? Morally clean, morally, clean. morally upright. Right. That is, if something looks bad, uh uh, don't do it. Okay? Above reproach would be the phrase to use. By his cleanness, that his sheep should live. He sets not his benefits to hire, that is, he doesn't rent out his job as priest. 
and left his sheep encumbered in the mire, that is the mud, and run to London to St. Paul, St. Paul's Cathedral, to seek him a chantry for souls or with a brotherhood, brotherhood, to be withhold or hired. Chaucer's talking about the practice of parish priests letting, like you go to London today, you'll see buildings, apartments, you know, to let. To let it means to rent, okay? Letting their parishes out, renting them out. Somebody pays them a certain amount so that that priest then goes off to London and does what? Gets a job as a chanter at St. Paul's, that is, is paid to do that, or gets a job as a priest for a guild. So he then earns what? Two sources of income. The one, the guy who's paying him, so that he could have the parish, because what can that person then do at the parish? He can use cursing to increase his tithes. So the tithes go to the church. Who's in charge of the parish church out in Podunksville? The priest. They go to support the priest. So now he has an income, and he could raise more than what he's paying the priest who's fled to London, Etc. No, this one dwelleth at home, keeps well his fold, so that the wolf would not make it miscarry. He was a shepherd, not a mercenary. And though he wholly were and virtuous, he was not to sinful men dispiteous, that is, scornful. So, let me pick other people to pick on. He wouldn't go up to JR when he found JR at the whorehouse and go, oh, you're going to get it. No, he wouldn't do that. What would he do? Nor of his speech, dangerous, proud, nor haughty. But in his teaching, he was discreet and courteous. He wouldn't say from the pulpit, and those of you, JR, that I've seen at the places of ill repute, he goes, JR, you're not going to do this. You've got to stop doing this. You know, your wife. He would be discreet and do what? Draw folk to heaven by fairness. Good example. He was not, if you've read the early American preacher, Jonathan Edwards, in his god-awful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. What is the purpose of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? To scare the hell out of you. To scare the heaven into you, or to scare you into heaven. Anything in that in that sermon about love, about what John says, shortest you know description of God in the Bible? God is love. No, their God is what? Hatred. Man, he is a flamethrower. He's a, you know. I saw that look you gave at me, Jamie. You know, he's just gonna torch everybody. That bus I think I've talked about here, the old. Middle Tennessee Baptist Church used, that used to be um, over where the graduate studies office now is, they had a bus parked out front and had flames on the side with the words, pulling you know souls out of hell one at a time. Like, you get born and your soul automatically. I mean, that's, that's its home. It's going to go to hell. Weird theology. Okay? No. This Burn was turn, his... Right? Pardon? Burn a turn. Right? Burn a turn. This was his business. But, I won't pick on Jared this time. If Mitch was obstinate in that sin, yeah, but Pastor, I mean, she's really cute. And my wife, she's cute. Mm -hmm. What so he were of high or low estate? Estates, the three estates? Even if the person was a nobleman or the poorest slob in the parish, him would he snibbin sharply for the nuns. Okay? Snibbin. Your boss tells you rebuke. You know what else snibbin means? Snip. Like prune. Cut back. Not literally. He's not going on that. You know, you're sinning with that right hand. And Jesus said, better enter a heaven without a hand than, so I'm going to cut him off. It's not what he means. 
He means what? He would kind of prune him in shape. He would publicly rebuke him. Why? A better, not why, a better priest, I trow, that is, I believe, there is nowhere than this guy was. He waiteth after no pomp and circumstance, uh, pomp and reverence. Waiteth. He doesn't expect it. He doesn't look for it. Okay. Who, who have we just heard about that kind of is all about pomp and reverence? Uh, prior. After the wife of Bath. <coughs> Mounds of hair coverings, big old wide hat. Has to be first in line. I've been to Jerusalem three times. See, how would people know that she's been to Jerusalem three times? She's how long has Chaucer known these people? He just got there. They just got there. Okay. So, nor made he a spiced conscience that is overly fastidious, but Christ's lore teaching. And his apostles 12, he taught. But first he followed it himself. Okay? Nothing, absolutely nothing undercuts the portrayal of this guy. And when he gets his turn to tell his tale, and it's the last one, you get a humdinger of a homily. I mean, he can sermonize. Okay? Well, who's with him? His brother who's the plowman, okay? Notice, they're both poor. They are dirt poor. They are the dirtiest, poorest people in the entire Canterbury Tales, okay? There, with him there was a plowman, his brother, that had a lad carried of dung full many a father, that is cartload, a true swinkerer, that worker, and good was he, living in peace and perfect charity. By saying this guy carried full many a load of dung, that means that's what he does. Carts around dung. Okay? So he's not just a plowman. He also does what? Cleans out stables to use the dung to fertilize the fields. This guy probably smells like dung, even when he cleans. He still smells like dung. Think. And how does he live? In peace and perfect charity. Connor already told us what the word charity means. Love. Comes from the Latin caritas. Okay? God loved he best with his whole heart at all times, though he gained or smirked your gloss. Whether he rejoiced, that's the game, or suffered. St. Paul says, be content in all things. No matter what happens to him, thank you, God. Thank you, God. He doesn't say, where is God, you know, when his cart breaks down or something. What else? At all time, um, so he loves God with all his heart. And then his neighbor right as himself. So what does he do? That's a very clear biblical illusion. Those two things are what Christ says sum up the entire Old Testament. That is, those are the two things you really need to do. Love God with your whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself and you will have eternal life. Okay? So, like his brother, he's the quote-unquote perfect Christian. He would thresh and dig and delve for Christ's sake for every poor white, poor person, without hire if it lay in his mind. Without hire, without pay. Oh! You need a field planted? I'll do it. No, don't worry about paying me. I'll take care of it. His tithes paid he full fair and well, that is, never got behind, and he always paid. What does the word tithe literally mean? One-tenth. 
10% of whatever his income was, he paid it. Both of his own work and his possessions. Okay? So not only of his income, but also of what he had, so to speak, in the bank. And in a tabard overshirt, he rode upon a mare. Tabard overshirt. What's he wearing? Apparently, all he's wearing, he's just got on like a rough woolen um, gown, cape almost, right? So then we get a Reeve, a Miller, a Sumner, a Pardner, a Mansipole, and Chaucer. Now, the Miller, how much time do we have? The Miller's an interesting character. Um, we find out he's a drunk. He's also a bit of a hothead. He's a brawler. And we get a lengthy description of him, right? He's got a big tuft of bristles coming out of his nose. Red bristles. He's got red hair, okay? Um, and he cheats people. He's a miller. So what does, that, what does a miller do? Grinds up wheat into flour. So he grinds it up. Know the description of the miller. He grinds it up and we're told 563. Yet he had a thumb of gold, pardee. Okay. What's Chaucer mean? Well, when he would grind out the flour, he would put the flour on one side of a scale, like in a, in a bag, and he would have weights on the other side of the scale to tell him how much the flour weighs. Like he'd have a bag of flour, he'd put it on the scale, and then he'd start adding weights to this to get them to balance. That way he would know how much flour was in the thing and how much to charge the people he ground it for. Because he charges by the pound. So what does he do? Why does he have a thumb of gold? Because he pushes down on the other end. That is, he makes it look like there's more flour than there actually is. So he cheats people? Yeah. He's a, he's a crook. Okay. Um, who else do we need to describe? You've got the Sumner and Pardoner. Um, let's see. Know the descriptions... Of the Miller, the Sumner, the Pardoner, we meet, if you've seen A Knight's Tale, you meet the Sumner and Pardoner, by the way. They're the two guys who keep coming after Geoffrey Chaucer for the, um, the uh, bad gambling debts. Okay. Um, and let's go on to the end of the general prologue. Let's see here. So the Sumner begins around line 623, probably has venereal disease because of the descriptions given to him. And then you have the Pardoner, line 669 and following, who has probably been castrated. Uh, according to what we're told about him. And I want to pick up with, let's see here. Uh, line 715. Chaucer says. Okay, so now I've told you the estate, the array, the number, and the cause why all these people were assembled at the tavern. Now let me tell you what we did that evening before we left the next morning. Um, but first he says, line 725, First I pray you of your courtesy that you do not arrest it not my villainy. Don't hold it against, he says, uh, don't hold it against me to lack of manners. Though that I plainly speak in this matter to tell you their words and their cheer. 
What's he mean? I'm going to honestly report what I heard. If you're offended, don't hold it against me. Why? I'm merely the messenger. That is, I'm not the one saying this. Uh-uh. This is what they said. Okay? Even though I speak their words properly, even though I, I, I say exactly what they said, don't hold it against me. I, I don't talk like this. So, he says, For you know, as well so as all do I, whoso shall tell a tale after man, he must rehearse it as close as ever he can, every word. That is, if you're going to report something, you should report it how? Accurately. Word for word, if possible. <coughs> Don't embellish. Why? 735. Or else he must tell his tale untrue. Or feign something. Or find words new. Make it up. Um... Bob Woodward, famous journalist, Watergate, is famously known for creating quotes, quotations. That is, for writing biographies and putting words in people's mouths that they never actually really said. Because he takes other words other people have said, that other people have said the person he's writing about said, and creates a quotation. Right? There is a biography, um, autobi uh, auto autobiographies. One of Obama's autobiographies. Man, brains just fried. One of Obama's autobiographies talks about a girlfriend. The girlfriend never existed. She's a composite, if I remember right, of three different women. That's not an autobiography. What is that? It's fiction. When you take three people and make one up, that's fiction. So he says, you got to report it accurately. So uh, I'm going to skip a bunch and go down to 747. Great cheer made our host to us each one. Set us down to the supper, served us with vittles, etc., etc. Um... And the host comes up with the idea and says, 761. Now, lords, truly, ye are to me right welcome heartily. That is, welcome to my fine establishment. For my truth, I will not lie. I didn't see such a company here in this, uh, th this year. You guys are the best group that's come in. Okay? So he says... Gladly would I do you mirth, fain would I do you mirth, if I knew how. And I've got a thought in my mind that could be, do you some mirth. If it pleases you, and it won't cost you a penny. So you, 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 you like this idea? I'm going to do something for you, and it won't cost you a dime. So you're on your way to Canterbury, God speed you. All right. And I'm going to come along. And well, I know, as you go by the way, you shape in you to tell and to play. That is, they're going to do what? To kill time as they go on along. You're not going to have 30 people riding and some walking on along, and it's just total silence. No, you're going to do something to keep yourselves interested. So here's what I propose. That if you like all by one assent to stand at my judgment and for to proceed, as I'll tell you, tomorrow when you go by the way, now by my father's soul that is dead. So he swears by his dead father. I'll come with you. So you agree? And they apparently do. And he says, okay, now let me finish. Hearken for the best. 789. Take it not, I pray you, in disdain. Here's the point. Each of you will do what? To speak short and plain that each of you to shorten with our way in this viage shall tell twelve, uh, tell tales tway to Canterbury word. To shorten our trip, you will each tell two short tales 
on the way to Canterbury and two on the way back. Of adventures that will all have befallen, that is, of things, stories that have once happened. They aren't short, by the way. The, lo the Knight's Tale is the longest. It's huge. Okay? That's why I don't teach it. We don't have time. So what kind of tales? In which of you that beareth him best of all, that is to say, that tells in this occasion tales of best sentence meaning in most soulless enjoyment, shall have a supper at all our cost. We will all buy that person's supper. For the person who tells the tale with the best kind of moral meaning and the most enjoyment. Horace, first century Roman poet, said the purpose of literature was to teach, that's the moral meaning, and delight. It ought to be fun. It ought to be interesting. Okay? So, he says, I'll ride with you, my own cost, I'll be your guide. And anybody who goes against my judgment, that person will pay. And we said, all right, let's go. That sounds good. So they accord to his judgment. Um, the host was one of them. Let's see here. Yeah, we'll stop there. And the tales begin with the knight's tale. And the knight tells a great high tale of romance. Two knights fall in love with the same woman. I'll say something about it. So, for quiz on Tuesday, all the background stuff to Chaucer and general prologue. Parts that we discussed. 